welcome back to another episode of the Skits and Giggles podcast. For this one, we dive deep into the afterlife with Reto Abishaw. However, in this instance, the afterlife is not a promised existence in your favorite spiritual realm. No, the afterlife is the name of Reto's homemade carbon enduro bike that he also rode at the recent Best Ride of the Year in Tune. We get the all-access, behind-the-scenes look of what it's like to make your own carbon bike at home, the many frustrations and challenges along the way, key design decisions, insights into future improvements and, of course, the feelings of riding a bike you made yourself for the very first time. It's been almost two years since we first sat down with Reto to talk about his carbon workshop projects and it was fun catching up on the process of actually finishing the enduro bike he just started when we first talked. For more information about this episode and the Skits and Giggles podcast, you can just follow the links in the description. To support the podcast, please share this episode with your riding buddies or just leave us a five-star rating on your favorite platform. That's it, that's all Skigglers, and here's our chat with Reto Abishaw. Welcome back to the Skits and Giggles podcast, Reto Abishaw, better known as Mr. Sleeping Awake on Pink Bike and other social platforms. Amongst us at Skits and Giggles HQ is known as the legend. legend. How are you doing tonight? Doing fantastic. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> Bryson, how are you doing tonight? Very well. I'm also very excited. It's a pleasure to have you back, Reto, and great to see you again, Pascal. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, very well. Very excited for this one tonight. I think before we start with anything else, um, we need to talk about the best ride of the year. How good was the best ride of the year, Reto? It was the best. <laughs> Woo! Um, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> no, it was such a good day. We got super lucky um the rest of the season was like always super wet but we didn't really get rained out at all during the best ride of the year it was still muddy conditions were great though vibes were uh high and uh no it was, bad like, super trails cool to discover yeah no bad trails it was super cool to discover a new riding area um and together with some uh, awesome people make some uh uh, cool, cool friends, uh, connections there, and uh, get some, get a, a face to some uh, familiar voices. That was really cool. So, one special thing about that ride actually was, you brought your very special bike. I did bring my very special bike, and people yeah. want to hear more <laughs> about that special bike. <laughs> <laughs> right for context. Episode 48 is the first time we did talk to Reto about his uh, homemade carbon bikes. And at the time, he was really only just getting started with his own enduro bike. And today, it's almost two years later, Reto actually brought this homemade carbon enduro bike to the best ride of the year to much stoke reception. And people were very curious about the bike, uh, me included. And uh, that's why we're sitting back down to talk about the completion of the project. And I gave it back to Bryson because, sorry, I interrupted. No, no, we share this. We share the pain. But yeah, no, let's throw it back. You have the bike now. I've been riding with you a few times, actually. We've been riding, since we met, we've been riding quite a couple times, um, this year and last year. Uh, we're getting to know Plafine together, Kuzenberg. Oh, well, you're from the region, so you're actually just showing me. <laughs> But um, yeah, finally you're on your bike. I've seen you ride it. I saw you at the best ride of the year riding it, and just give us give us your overview. What's the what's going on with the bike right now? It it took a long time to finish. Uh, there were a lot of ups and downs uh, emotionally, and um, yeah, I feel like every part of the of the bike I built at least three times because I failed in the process. Um, but in the end, I think this is just what makes the experience uh, of the first ride even better, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I the goal was to take it to Whistler uh, last year. And that didn't happen just because things got away from me. And um, I had to finish it after, after my uh, Whistler vacation. Can't really be too mad about uh, going to Whistler anyway. It was a still awesome bike. 
uh, probably better option anyway, so don't want to break anything uh, on your vacation. And yeah, finished it, uh, finished it in uh, over winter time and in in spring. And now I have a couple of rides on it, and uh, yeah, working out pretty well. I don't know where to where to start actually. Um, Let's start with a feeling. Oh yeah. yeah. Let's How start with the feeling. Feel? How good was the feeling after two years of you know squirreling away in your shed and multiple failed attempts, and then taking it out for a ride and the head tube didn't snap. <laughs> <laughs> still didn't I checked for cracks as well the other day there's still no cracks so that's made me sleep better uh, no the feeling was just cool uh, I remember building it up in the workshop and it's getting late um, but uh, just put it uh, put it up in the workshop uh, leaned it against the table saw and just stepped back then and looked at it and it's just like you know, it's a new bike day. Everybody gets excited for new bike days, I think. But there, there's just like a little more to it because you were working hard. You you put in uh, a lot of effort. So it was was really rewarding. And then uh, the first ride, I guess, technically was just back from the workshop back home. And then the next day, uh, straight to uh, to Guzambel, which is some some real trails. Uh, rode with my um, with my uh, buddy there, and with I was pretty nervous on the way up. It's a good pedal uphill. Uh, the uphill is a uh, on a on a fire road, and then there's a and there's some good single tracks on the way down. Snapped a couple of pictures on the top, um, and then yeah, you just start rolling. Didn't. I told myself to take it super easy and yeah no don't overcook it um but as soon as I was on the bike it was it felt comfortable and or I felt comfortable and just kind of confidence inspiring uh, it's just kind of cliche and sounds stupid but I was definitely riding a lot faster than I should have and um it it worked out so I don't know it's still kind in one of, piece <laughs> yeah the the bike is and it's kind of overwhelming even to think about it there is just a lot that that happened and it's kind of kind of hard to put these emotions into words but um, i can imagine you were um listening to every little sound it made as you crawled up the fire road while you're rallying down the trail you were kind of like taking in the the motion of the way the bar moved how it was pivoting but it's not a completely fresh build. You had some familiar components on there. So you, you grab the wheels from your other bike and the brakes, right? Yeah, wheels and brakes are from other bikes. And then uh, uh, drivetrain as well is even uh, um, stolen from my other bike. I didn't want to go too far in in terms of investment somehow before I knew it worked out. Um, so I uh, stole these uh, components off of my other bike. And... Yeah, one would think so, like, but I think the first ride, I didn't think much. It was just, like, way too overwhelming to to really think about all these little things. Mm -hmm. um, that only really came came during the rides after that. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think the first ride, it was just, like... Relief. Joy, <laughs> relief, yeah. Um, yeah. And... Uh, like huge amounts of stoke but i i didn't i didn't go beyond that i don't think uh yeah there's only so much mental capacity i have so um but now that you've yeah. been on it a few hours like cumulative yeah. um where would you i mean the latest bike you could compare it to was your your obeya and how yeah. would you I mean, it's not a great comparison because uh, it's they're really different bikes. But what's your yeah, exactly. what's your comparison on these last latest yeah. two? So for context, because in in our last time you said you're probably going to build a bike that's slightly worse than something you can buy. So I want to. I'm hoping you're proving yourself wrong. Sorry if I'm loading yeah, that so it, gun it, right now. <laughs> it it definitely it definitely doesn't hold me back, and I was pretty uh, pretty stoked yesterday during the ride. Um, my body 
looked at me at the bottom and also told me, like, I feel like you're faster on the new bike than on the Rallon. Um, so, you know, probably subconsciously you push it a little more because you want that to be true as well. Um, I don't know, maybe, but it, it's the bike is definitely faster than I am. So yeah. that's already good. It's definitely not holding me back. Uh, the suspension is not dialed yet. Um, I have to invest some more time there. I have to really do some some bracketing. But I was kind of hoping to have like some better conditions, um, a little tackier, drier conditions to really uh, dial that in, to have a little bit more uh, braking traction as well. And just I could um, hit lines repeatedly uh, more um yeah just to have less uh, uh out like variables um due to uh slipping all over the place sliding all mm -hmm. over the place so um so i didn't really that do that i i oh, constantly fiddled a little bit with the dials and i think i'm getting closer but um yeah i kind of lost track uh what Pascal, are we he's a about? tickler Certified. He's a tickler. Yeah, that's oh, why yeah. you guys. That's why you guys get it all. That's why so we well. hit it off. But the kindred yesterday, spirits. yesterday we, we, I was on the ride yesterday, and um, I, you know, we didn't time anything, and we were in a group, and we we're just having fun. But I definitely noticed that you had a lot more confident because um, earlier, and and you know what, you were riding the same tires as what you were riding on your previous bike, so I can see directly. Yeah, they're like, a year old now. So yeah, and they're even more worn out because they've been yeah. down Whistler for a few days. And yeah. um, you definitely had more confidence. Like you had more confidence, given that yeah. you were running uh, like worse tires. But also, that's why I brought up this idea of you porting over some of the familiar components, because the way it is, the way I see it, is like you're eliminating some of that kind of like variables where you can mm -hmm. say like, oh, uh, you know, this and that with a bike when, you know, like the same way that they do like the field test on pink bike and stuff. They use all the same tires and wheels or whatever it is that they kind of like more or less even the playing field so they can analyze or report on yeah. the suspension movement and the feeling it gives them minus the tire equation. Because that's a huge thing, right? Yeah. But anyways, you definitely appeared more confident. And I mean, it just showed in your riding as well. Yeah, I never looked at it from this way, but I guess that's a fair point. And that's usually what we try to do in engineering at work as well. You only change like one variable at a time um, and then uh, you run the tests and, and, and see the outcome. Um, it's also like it's a big bike and it's made for the terrain we have here. And it's a very different bike than the than the Rallon. Um, it, the Rallon I ride is also the the uh, older generation with the 150 millimeters of um, rear wheel travel, and I mean, it's not a, a small bike by any means. The Rallon, and it's definitely not not slow. But um, with the high pivot design, uh, this high pivot suspension layout, I and also coil, the traction is just really really good and in the conditions we had here it was constantly wet constantly grimy i think that really really helps so i really like uh how it behaves in in these in these in these conditions it's also funny because i was slightly worried that uh, i have uh, fairly high anti-rise numbers um so the when i pull the rear brake the rear suspension um, should compress or does compress on the rear braking. And I was kind of worried that the suspension would firm up too much in, in these conditions um, or in, under these circumstances. But so far, that has not really been a, a problem and kind of controlling the chassis movement has been really nice. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It just works out i had a couple of of um points where i wasn't exactly sure how they would would behave but overall i'm mostly happy with these things so got lucky i guess i guess what we also should do is kind of uh, paint a mental picture for listeners what you actually try to achieve what maybe can you describe a little bit the design of the overall bike what uh, were kind of the key standout things and 
choices that you've made when you started the project? I went out to design a bike that was just made for the terrain I love to ride. And that is mostly rough, steep, um, rooty, gnarly uh, mountain bike trails. And I was absolutely happy um, to have a, a bike that maybe isn't the, the most poppy or uh, or like agile bike i just wanted to have a, a plow bike um, so this is what i set out to do and i landed on a high pivot design i have a good 160 millimeters of uh, rear travel uh, with a nearly fully rearward axle path axle path Uh, combined with a 170 millimeter uh, fork, I have a fairly long reach of uh, I think 490 millimeters, um, and a very steep C tube angle of uh, 80 degrees, and a very slack uh, 63 degree head tube angle. Um, I was happy to have a little bit more weight, um, carry that around. Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, like most of the of the riding we do here is uh, up fire roads. I don't intend to use it too often for like single track uh, climbing and stuff like that, uh, or like cross country loops. Um, so uh, that went out the window. Um, as a design compromise, uh, I'm gonna use a different bike for that. Um, I did I did ride it on uh, on cross country trails and it's absolutely hilariously bad. So that was kind of <laughs> cool to see as well. Um, it's probably like a waterbed. <laughs> yeah, it it feels like a course ship or something. Um, it's kind of hard to navigate through trees. Okay. So you uh, mentioned uh, high pivot designs. There's obviously a couple of those uh, out in the market uh, today. But uh, overall, what was kind of the, the inspiration of the design you were going for? Yeah, um, when I started designing it, I think um, the Forbidden Druid, the first generation, um, just came out halfway through uh, uh, my first sketches. Um, and that kind of encouraged me to go with the high pivot design because I felt like, okay, if it works for even a smaller trail bike, um, the, the drag of the idler or things like that shouldn't, shouldn't really be a, a problem. And when I started this design, like you could, yeah, there were uh, the first high pivot bikes popping up again, but um, they weren't nearly as, as uh, popular as, as that or as they are now. I tried to come up with a suspension layout and um, had some other bikes as a as inspiration, and then I got a license for um, a linkage, uh, the suspension uh, design uh, cat cat software, and you can do some absolutely beautiful stuff. And then you start like designing, like three D modeling the bike, and then you realize, oh, there's absolutely no way I can. Uh, <laughs> fit all these uh, uh, bearings around the bottom bracket and around the, and the, and the cranks and, and stuff like that. And then I kind of go back and forth between between uh, uh, the two programs and, and start from there. Um, but when I started, I also had like not much um, understanding. Or I just had some basic understanding of, of how uh, suspension should, should work and... Um, You kind of read up on on all of that, and you kind of make it work. So you you have a um, upside down horse link. Or yeah, what was exactly. It? it it's basically a horse link design, but it's upside down. So um, usually a horse link has a, a pivot on the on the chainstay, and I have a pivot on the seat stay, and the rocker link is attached to the. Um, chain stay and then I have a shock tunnel uh, through the C tube where the, the shock uh, is driven from the rocker link um, I guess it's kind of hard to put in words um, 
but it is the same suspension layout as the new um, Forbidden Dru uh, not the Druid, the Dreadnought, um, which uh, mm -hmm. made me kind of mm -hmm. happy. So I was yeah. I was ready to <laughs> drop uh, money on a yeah I was I was ready to drop money on a on a dreadnought in case my bike wouldn't work out so <laughs> and we'll, actually I want to get to the reasons why but first I want to ask you two questions uh, one is um, yeah so we've been to the best ride of the year we've gone on some group rides you've uh, definitely have some people ask you some questions about your bike but what's been like the number one question the number one question is probably from non uh, core mountain bikers that look at the bike and ask me what that idler does and then that's ah. kind of hard to explain um and then uh i don't know what what would you, um oftentimes you just like get asked like oh you you made it yourself it's like how and that's also kind of hard to put in words or like at least in two sentences well, we can um, explore that. How much time do you have? Uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> yeah, in a long format like, here. Episode 48. Give it a listen. <laughs> episode um, 48.5. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, um, it, it really depends uh, who you talk to, I guess. Um, sometimes you can just like nerd out over a little detail. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a few people ask me if I painted it myself as well. Um which I did, and I think it looks good from afar. I tend to see uh, uh, all the little uh, imperfections, so I'm not. That's one of the things I'm not super stoked about the paint job. And what name did you paint on this bike? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Oh, that was such a journey just to pick a name. Naming products is so hard, but um, I uh, whenever I heard like a a good word, like a striking word i thought that could work as a as a name um like bright brown? i wrote it down yeah like bright brown i uh i wrote it down i had a whole list and in the end i picked uh afterlife i thought that was kind of mm. fitting because okay. uh after so much time in the workshop and not thinking about any other projects um i can start to have a, a life again <laughs> so <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess there was at the best ride of the year. There was a there was a couple of. Uh, I mean, the good thing was there was also other frame builders and other fellow tinkerers present. And I guess the some of the the questions and discussions were pretty technical. Um, yeah, for sure. I did. I did hear an stuff, offer. I, I did hear an offer to buy one, but I think uh, we won't see the the light of that. I guess. <laughs> no, definitely not. There's, you know, you can you can make one bike and that's one thing but if you want to start to produce them in a in a small uh, uh, series or like if you want to make multiple like to sell first of all i would definitely not feel comfortable um i would definitely not feel comfortable selling it to somebody without any fatigue testing i don't think it's gonna it's gonna break right away uh, or the head tube snaps off <laughs> but you never know and you kind of want to make sure before you hurt somebody else even more so than 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 yourself so there's that and then what are the chances they want the exact same size so uh, the molds would already sure. out the window and then yeah um, there's so much more to it so absolutely but it was it was funny on that parking lot where we all standing around around the bike and uh a lot of uh, a lot of uh, technical chatter going back and forth, and a lot of interest. And uh, what you did this yourself? Oh my god! <laughs> like, yeah, it was really it was really cool. Yeah, I was I was pretty pretty happy about that. The goal for me was to have a bike that doesn't look homemade. It, it was always the, the the goal to have something that looks factory, um, and you can't just like tell obviously oh yeah that's that's a shop made bike um so i think i got pretty close to that so all right well so that is now the feel good story so far mm -hmm. but you know you came around you had the idea it all worked out the head tube didn't snap so far and yeah, yeah. that is all very very feel good but uh, let's talk about some of the low points 
Yeah. There was some um, manufacturing mishaps. There oh, were yeah. some mishaps. I remember seeing different uh, pink posts, pink bike posts and social medias and all the rest of it of uh, things having gone not too great. Because yeah, you started out with an idea. Please elaborate. Yeah, you started yeah, out with an idea so, to manufacture you know. it. And then you decided yeah. something else, right? Yeah, well, that was just like uh, out of necessity because uh, at some point, if you if you try the same thing over and over again and it doesn't work out, you know, you should probably change something at some point. Um, yeah, so the whole project, um, I mentioned the suspension. So I never designed a, a mountain bike suspension before. So you start reading up on that and, and you make up something there. And you figure it out over time, you know, but the whole project, like every part of the project was basically that exact same process. Um, it was out of my comfort zone, out of my wheelhouse um, for many of the of the steps. I felt pretty confident in the 3D modeling part um, because I think this is one of, my, of the things I, I do well and is one of my strengths. Um, but then making uh, a part like that or like parts like that is fairly, fairly complex, um, out of carbon fiber. Uh, there are some really challenging, uh, challenging, uh, things. And if I had to redesign a bike again, it would definitely not have a shock tunnel, um, just because that, that just added so much complexity and so much frustration into the process. Um, but yeah, I, I struggled, I struggled a lot, um, with, with the manufacturing part, um, and, and learned a lot. I built carbon fiber, uh, negative molds, um, to laminate the front triangle with a pre uh, carbon fiber inside these negative molds and the molds worked out um, okay. I um, have a bit of experience with the mold making, so that was uh, less of a, of a problem. But then this was by far the most complex um, parts that I made in, in carbon fiber. And just to give you some context, you know, typically uh, um, if you have a uh, a mountain bike frame built in a factory you have like a complete kit like all the sheets of carbon fiber are pre-cut um, on a on a cnc plotter and you have a stack of of all pre-cut um, uh, things and this is all engineered already so i kind of made it up on the go i had a layup um in that i that i designed or specified but then exactly what shape every individual individual patch had, um, I kind of had to adjust that on the go, and that takes just a lot of time. And laminating the front triangle uh, took about thirty five hours um, of uh, of time just uh, to get all the the layers in in place and everything well compacted and and put in place. So. When I closed the mold and and pressurized the the bladders, and I had a, a leak in the in the bladder, and it's on the inside of the of the bike frame, and you can't do anything about it anymore because the molds are closed, the the overlaps in the pre brakes are uh, sticking to each other, and when you rip it open, you just like destroy the whole process. So. I wasted a whole lot of uh, fairly expensive uh, raw material and like 35 hours down the drain, start cleaning the molds and reapply a uh, release agent. Um, and yeah, I did that two times. The third, uh, I had to make the front triangle three times before it worked out. So the third one uh, finally worked. Um, adjusted some things and ended up making a uh, silicon, uh, heavy silicon bladder um, that already has like the inside shape of all the, like the, the silicon bladder has the shape of the void inside the the front triangle basically. Um, 
So and it's very sturdy because it's a uh, well, like two millimeters of uh, silicon, and it doesn't break as easily and it's very flexible. So in the end, I had to go down this route. I had to make that bladder as well, which I tried to avoid and use some uh, basically vacuum backing uh, film. Um, but the problem is once you you can't really place it correctly or, or perfectly inside the, the uh, closed mold because once the mold is closed you can't access anything and then if you have uh, some bridging in like a sharp corner um, then uh, it's just like easy to 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 pop that um, that vacuum back so there was a lot of um, things like that and even uh, machining little bits uh, on my on my CNC router, um, you know, with every CNC program that you that you uh, that you write, um, you just gain an experience and become uh, more proficient with it. But um, I basically built the CNC as well to make that bike. So I'm. It's not like I have a ton of experience with machining stuff and. Yeah, so it has been a, a struggle and, and and a challenge, but it was, um, even though it was frustrating in parts, it was very rewarding. So, but uh, did you did you do everything on your own, or did you did you get some help when frustration levels were too high? <laughs> yeah, um, I talked to a few smart people, um, uh, to a few smart people. Um, but I, I think I'm way too stubborn to ask for for help with these projects. Sometimes, I think there would be uh, an easier way. But for me, it's kind of part of the of the process. It's just like struggle through a, a little bit as well. Um, and there's also, yeah, it, there's fairly little information out there on on uh, the specific process I used so it was kind of hard to find the right people even to to ask um, about advice the people I would have access to um, they could or like there is very smart people I could talk to but then they can give you some advice how it would be done in the industry if you want to make a thousand parts, which is not necessarily <laughs> applicable yeah, to no. me. So right. it's always finding the right balance. And I certainly talk to to a lot of people um, like informally and and uh, got some got some advice. But um, yeah, probably should have uh, talked to 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 more. I can never hurt really. But. Mm. But uh, you know the funny thing is, I guess that's uh, you know also for context, right? So it's also your professional life is also composites. Yeah, somewhat tangent. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but um, it's you know, at least you, you have a, a network available to you and some, yeah, exactly, some experience yeah. and and contacts etc. that, that yeah. you could lean on to. Yeah. Um, so I work in the composite industry. I don't work with com deposits per se um, too much anymore professionally um, but uh, I am responsible for the engineering of like production lines um, of, to make composite materials so uh -huh, okay. um, uh, but yeah it's close would, enough it's close oh, yeah, no for, of course yeah yeah and um, <laughs> but yeah yeah so but it's not like I'm in a in a uh, laminating uh, parts every day anymore uh, or things like that so there's a lot of uh, experience I was I was lacking definitely so uh, for sure yeah. for sure I was also not 100% serious let's oh, not no, overthink no, this <laughs> <laughs> Bryson you had a second question that you wanted to ask so I'm bringing it back to you oh no it was it was answered uh-huh no no actually okay well, actually the second question was because based on the first one, what people were asking you about, what was like the, you know, like the, the number one question, um, in terms of you, what was actually the hardest part, like the single hardest part to, 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 to do, let's say. Yeah. In comparison, um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so the one I struggled 
with the most was definitely the front triangle. Um, just because it is a, a, a fairly uh, complex complex shape and it's also like highly structural so you you really don't want it to to go uh, like you don't want to take any shortcuts there so mm -hmm. um, but I also struggled a lot with the painting and painting is just like a whole different um, yeah it, it's nearly like it could be a profession or something like that <laughs> <laughs> it might be. It might be. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's hard, and with the the painting, I don't really have access to a to a paint shop or anything. So you kind of do it in a. I did it in my my personal uh, workshop, but it's just dusty. There's a, nothing is prepared for. I used a, a shitty air compressor, and then you don't have a. Uh, the proper filters in place so you end up with some uh, 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 moisture in the uh, in the compressed air and then you have some fish eyes and uh, you start uh, and then there's so much sanding involved it's just absolutely nuts so uh, I have a lot of respect for people who can uh, get like perfect paint jobs on bikes now even more so than than before so mm -hmm. um, yeah that was kind of a lot of uh, spoken and it, as a it's real. Also, it's also pretty bad because you feel like you're on the on the final stretch of the project, and it's just like throw on some paint. But I always also had like that goal to make it look factory, and this is all make or break by the paint job. So you kind of want to get just get it out of the workshop and start writing, but at the same time, it's like ah, uh, if I spend some more. A couple more hours sanding primer, then it's gonna look better, and yeah, so. And the paint is already chipping in a couple of places, so. Eh. Back to your um, your topic of the the hardest part, or one of the hardest parts being the front triangle itself. Um, we talked a little. We just talked very briefly the first on the episode forty eight about the layup, and you you know there's a couple of rules of thumb in terms of uh, the you know the directions that the carbon fibers go. In, term, yeah. in terms to create like a good layup for strength and, you know, torsion ability and things like this. Um, did you, through your, through your findings and you're working out the solutions, did you come up with some, some novel solutions or like maybe some things that are probably done in the industry as far as you know that uh, you use specifically for the bike that really made the difference? Yeah, so I think with the, the layup, I didn't really look for anything um out of the ordinary, uh, I did some funky layups um, on previous projects when I built skis. Uh, tried some new stuff uh, that worked out that worked out well, and they are ridiculously light and 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 hold up. Um, but with the bike, I did some reverse engineering of uh, of another carbon frame. Uh, that I cut down and uh, if you cut out a little coupon and you can burn away the, the resin with a blowtorch and uh, carbon fiber carbon fiber doesn't uh, burn away so you can separate the, la the layers and if you have a, a precision scale you can even uh, figure out the surface weight of uh, each individual layer and you can see the fiber orientation um, so I learned a lot from from that just to see what is what is done um, on uh, on other bikes. Um, there's a broken bike that I uh, that I cut up, and um, yeah, then you just have some specific requirements. For example, so I have the the shock mount is on the down tube, and just because of that, I have a bending load on on the down tube. And if you have the shock mount just at the bottom bracket area, for example, then the down tube wouldn't see that that bending load um, that pushes that tries to break your or bend your um your down tube. So I beefed it up quite a bit and have a, a much chunkier layup um, than uh, than the reference uh, that I cut up. And you do some uh, back of the envelope uh, calculations, and then uh, have a safety factor of two, and then you call it a day. So. 
yeah. and now the bike weighs uh, 37 weight. kilos. Well, yeah, <laughs> I was actually like comparing it yesterday to my uh, friend's new Raw Madonna, and uh, like just in the parking lot without a scale, mine felt still lighter than the Madonna, which is not oh, okay. saying much, Win. but yeah, yeah. still, I'm actually I'm pretty pretty happy uh, on how well it pedals. Um, I think I never hit really more than a good thousand meters of uh, vertical in a day, but like I think on a yeah, um, it's it's a easy. It's definitely worse, uh, slightly worse than the the uh, Orbea Rallon, but it's not like night and day either. So I'm happy to pedal it around all day. So yeah, not too bad. It's purpose built. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So listening to you um, talk about having to build the equipment so you can build a bike, uh-huh. I kind of uh, had this idea in my mind. And um, did you ask yourself like a very w- one one very specific question at the beginning of this of this endeavor? You know, you 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 had this idea to make a make your own mountain bike. Of course, you, you previously built your own road bike. Different story, but. When you said to yourself, I'm going to build a mountain bike, what kind of questions went through your head? Yeah, I was kind of considering um, building a hardtail just because it's easier, basically. And I did talk to Vlad. Um, he used to make, a, he built a, an awesome downhill bike uh, from Carbon Fiber as well. And he is now... If I'm not mistaken, uh, the designer. We are at, one. We are one exactly. Uh, really cool dude. Yeah, I believe Flood, the the original design of his uh, downhill bike. That's what they're uh, using still um, as the basis of uh, the current World Cup bike that we are one is uh, is developing. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. From what I understand, they uh, cut up uh, an arrival and then uh, uh, glued it back together. Um, with the geometry they wanted and uh, called it a, a, a downhill bike yeah and it, it looks so clean so they did a yeah, good job beautiful. with that yeah mm-hmm. yeah so um i talked to him and he was like listen you're gonna spend so much time um building it might as well just really build the bike you want and not just like uh, um make a hard tail um just because it's easier Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so I guess I went. Uh, the qu- the question in my mind because I'm listening. Uh, like I remember back uh, when we did the last pod, you um, you mentioned that there's tons of stories with uh, with your dad and growing up in a house where, you know, it was available to do shop stuff and work with your hands and there's tools in abundance and I, I kind of have the feeling you kind of just walk around and you're like. Can I build that? <laughs> and then you look at something else and you're like, could I build that? <laughs> yeah. The answer, and the answer is yes, right? Well, that, that's the thing what I learned um, over time, you know, like I think most people can make, a, could build a lot more than what they think they can. And with the bike as well, like when I started, I didn't have the skills to build the bike, but you built the skills on the way and and now i do so you kind of grow with the project um sounds like a bauhaus commercial but it's kind of true so <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's the same with everything right so it's the same with uh you know with our little podcast if you listen to our uh first five episodes you're gonna be like dang those guys are never gonna make it to 10 yeah. episodes and look <laughs> at us we're here it's uh, you know it's gonna be 81 and uh yeah. we're still learning we're trying new things yeah. we're, exactly or we're just stupid that could also yeah be. yeah yeah but some blissful <laughs> ignorance helps as well so. <laughs> exactly the right kind of stupid yeah exactly <laughs> so pascal um i've got two more uh potent questions but before i kind of like crack on with those is there anything you want to um are you still curious about something about reto's bike and what and his journey so far because i want to i want to i want to throw a a spin on this whole debacle 
All right, cool. So then I throw my last one in sure. because I, I already asked it uh, on the best ride of the year, but uh, I think I, we want to we want to capture it forever. Is uh, you know what kind of things? Uh, you know, of course, your project is finished. You're like super stoked that the head tube didn't snap in the first thing, and then you're going like, okay, so how am I going to make it better? Yeah. So what are the, what are the things you're going to work on? Oh, we well, there's always there's always stuff. Um, and especially when you have a project, you know, this is just, it says prototype on the side. So I guess that's an excuse for everything. Um, but you learn stuff on the way and, and whatever project it is, it, by the end of the project, it's never like you're never 100% satisfied. Um, so there might be a new uh, rear end um, coming at some point. For now, it's working well, but there is a couple of things I think I could I could improve. Um, I one of the things would be a, a heel clearance, um, so I have a little less heel rub, um, kind of minor, uh, but also just like visually, I think I could make it a little more um, interesting. I could also directly integrate uh, lower idler pulley into the chainstay and that could maybe help shifting performance which is not great right now. Um, I'm not 100% sure uh, why that is but I talked to um, Stefan Lorenz from uh, Scar Cycles and he told me as well that or he mentioned that uh, that they had some uh, poor shifting performance um, on high pivot bikes high pivot bikes without a lower idler um, and I would also be curious to have maybe a floating uh, brake mount option just to see <laughs> what that would do but I'm not sure I would go this far so yeah um, remember Vlad's advice stuff. yeah <laughs> exactly just build it yeah but it <laughs> yeah but it probably also comes you with some so downsides much time. <laughs> it probably also comes with some downsides I think probably the the stiffness of the brake mount would be a lot uh, well it would be a lot less stiff so I would be worried that comes with a lot of brake noise just because of uh, some Weird, yeah, vibration uh, resonances and stuff like that so yeah not mm. not the good mm. vibrations yeah yeah <laughs> um and honestly i'm not sure how i would integrate it into the current design so but i mean what is cool i mean obviously i've seen it and i'm sure we're gonna put photos up on the instagrams um with this episode so people can have a look too but i mean it's, it's i think there's uh, plenty of optionality in the design that I think you don't have to change a lot of things fundamentally. So let's say the lower link, for example, that would give you plenty of options to, you know, you mentioned it, play with linkage, work on different uh, leverage curves, different anti-squat, different this and that. And um, yeah. yeah, so I mean, I guess you could uh, take some inspiration of, uh, you know, whatever, Geometrons and Nikolais and with their mutator stuff. Yeah, for um, sure. And just do simple, simple, um, simple optionality pieces that you can make longer chain stays, different, different shock lengths, different leverage curves, etc. Yeah, yeah, you have a lot of a uh, lot of options. I think you could um, play around with just some uh, some pivot locations, or even just the, the position of the idler pulley on these um, high pivot bikes has a huge impact on on the the pedaling characteristics as well um and just half a millimeter just throws it off uh, completely so um yeah there's a lot of uh, room to play around i yeah i'm not running out of ideas anytime soon i don't think good and uh, just for the record i think it looks absolutely amazing and knowing the full backstory of this project just makes it so much better Ah, cool, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm mega stoked that the head tube didn't snap off yet. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> yeah. And I want to be By there the when way. it happens. <laughs> <laughs>
It's a for the for the listeners that don't know, that's a running gag between the three of us. Yeah, I, I really <laughs> hope if it happens, somebody captures it on video. So you need to get a GoPro. Yeah, maybe first person head tube snappage. Yeah, <sighs> does not sound fun. Well, I guess with that we can close it out. Uh, Reto, if our listeners want to reach out to you, they want to learn more. I just got a text message from Yeti. He's asking when he, you are taking orders. Um, where can they find you? Uh, probably Instagram would be the best. Uh, at Reto Abisher, I think. Sweet. I'll put that into the show notes as well so people can find it there. And I think with that, we close it out for the night. Very cool. It was a pleasure, as always. Well, Thank yeah, you, it was uh, cool talking to you guys. Uh, get on to a couple of tangents. All right. Have a good night. Talk to you next time. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks for listening. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. Why don't you let us know what you think? We really like to hear from our listeners. To find out how to get in touch with us, follow the links to our website in the description or find us on Instagram under at Skits and Giggles. Until next time, Skigglers. <laughs>